Um, there was a question. Uh, Mike raised a question last Sunday about um, about some of the sources and broadband stuff like that. And um, I did. I just want to let you know that I took <clears throat> I took that as an opportunity to go back and do some more checking on some things. And uh, all of the I I look I looked at the end of the chapter that um, that Broadbent did, and I looked at what he used as his sources, and I actually found all of them on the internet. So then from there, I source checked what he was saying and where he was getting his information from, and it's opposite of what this guy's saying in this book that you gave me. So it appears to me that there is amongst, if you want to call it the scholars or whatever term you want to use for it, that there is a diversity of opinion about the true nature of the Wadentians, and there is uh, there are some that view it the way that I explained it to you last Sunday, and there are others that view it differently. Um, but anyway, I say that to let you know that I've, I've linked up to all those sources. You can go back and read them yourself. You brought up a question about uh, the Bishop of Turin and whether or not what Broadbent was saying was accurate and stuff like that. Remember that question that you brought up, Mike? You can, you can go back into the sources and read. You, you can read Claude of Turin in English, and then it goes back to Latin, and the guy has all the stuff right there of the, what this guy actually said in the, in the primary source. So, um, I have no reason to, to, to question at this point whether or not, you know, um, Broadbent was playing fast and loose with the sources. Um, so, anyway, I just mentioned that to you. Um, I have a few more things, Mike, that I wanted that I always wanted to share with you, but we'll do that when this is over. But all that stuff is on the internet. Um, one of the I actually found easy, when I was doing that. One of Broadbent's sources was a, was German. It was a German book, and I actually found it. I can't read it because I can't read German, but um, it's actually you, it's amazing to me how much of this stuff you can actually run down if you know where and how to look for it to find the uh, the actual materials. Okay. Chapter 25, the Christian Middle Ages, the internal history of the Catholic Church. The last three Sundays we've, we've been studying uh, groups that were never a part of the Catholic Church and stood against the Catholic Church for various reasons. We talked about the Paulicians, we talked about the Bogomils, we talked about the Cathars, or the Cathari, and, and last Sunday we talked about the Waldensians. Now there are a few other groups that we could mention. Uh, but it's going to essentially be the same story that we've been telling for the last three weeks. Okay, So for the sake of time and expediency of moving forward with the information, I've decided that uh, if you're interested in those things, you can look at them yourself. Now we are going to talk specifically uh, probably in about two weeks about uh, John Wycliffe and John Huss and some of those groups uh, as, as forerunners of the, the Protestant, uh, what, what happened with the Protestant Reformation. So anyway, we're going to go back today to looking at some things regarding the, Catholic, the internal history of the Catholic Church. All right. Now, when we were last here three or four weeks ago, okay, when we last studied this, we looked at the coronation of Charlemagne by the Pope. You remember that? How the Pope crowned Charlemagne uh, Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. We looked at Charlemagne's church-sanctioned campaign of terror against the Saxons and other groups in Europe. We talked about the Viking invasions and the emergence of feudalism and how the, immune, the emergence of feudalism in this decentralized power structure in Europe increased the power of the popes and the power of the papacy throughout the Middle Ages. And furthermore, we considered how the lack of centralized government during the Middle Ages caused the power of the papacy to increase. Okay, So, four weeks ago when we were last looking at the church, that's what we saw. So hopefully you remember that, hopefully you were here and you recall that. If you don't, well... You have to go back and watch the class because I'm not going to repeat all of it at this point, okay? But Charlemagne, folks, was not the only king to receive a crown from the Pope during the Middle Ages, all right? Other kings are going to be crowned, and more kings than just the ones that I have listed here, okay? Uh, but Louis the Pious was coordinated by Pope Stephen IV at Reims, okay? Uh, Pope Stephen is reported to have said the following at the coronation. O Christian ruler of the empire of the world and master of the ages, you have willed that, notice, Rome be the head of the earthly globe. Grant our prayers. Okay? 
So again, are these guys, they, their estimation of their power and authority has gone way beyond now just being the head of a church. Okay? They view themselves as having the authority to, to tell kings what to do, to prop kings up, to pull kings down, to uh, do all of the things that are necessary uh, to increase the power of the church. Uh, Louis II in 850 and Charles the Bald in 875 were, the, were also crowned by different popes. Okay, so different different kings. There's more that we could include, but I don't want to get too bogged down in that. I just want you to see that this this whole idea of the pope being able to coronate or crown Charlemagne and having the, him viewing himself as having the authority to do so. Did not stop there. It happened multiple successive times throughout the Middle Ages, where the popes are intervening uh, in the, if you want to call it secular, in the secular power structures to to prop up the leadership that they wish to have to, to see in power. Okay. Yeah. Um, before the pope used to do the crowning, who used to do crown the kings then? Well, before the Middle Ages, it was Rome. The, the, you know, the, the empire, okay? But before that, it was basically when, when Rome fell, remember we talked about this a little bit, that, and, and that, that centralized authority of the old Roman Empire was gone, what you were left with was essentially a series of warlords with little tribes of warriors who basically went and duked it out with each other to see who would be the next, you know, and that's how, that's how, um, um, what's the guy's name now, Pepin? And um, um, what's his name? I can't remember his name now. But that's how they—that's how those guys, you know, went about things. And then eventually, over time, we talked about how Charles Martel, you know, defeats the, the Muslims, and how the Franks emerge as a power, and then how the the papacy uh, crowns Charlemagne king of the Franks, as the the reinstitutes the Holy Roman Empire, and stuff like that. Now, certainly, not all the kings and kingdoms and so forth are going are, are are having this happen. But any of them that Rome feels it has enough authority to tell them what to do, they're they're not hesitating to do that sort of thing. Okay. Now, over time, though, through a matrix of complex circumstances, secular authorities challenge the power of the church. Okay. Now, do these kings like the pope telling them what to do? No, okay, but they view themselves. And we talked about uh, four weeks ago about excommunication and interdiction and what those things meant, and how the popes would use them to coerce uh, people into doing what they wanted them to do. But over time, through a matrix of complex circumstances, secular authorities challenged the power of the church by seeking to appoint their own clergy. Okay, a process known as lay investiture. In addition, many church positions were being sold through a practice known as simony. Okay? The result was that many church officials were loyal to their earthly lord rather than the papacy. So what, you have two things going on here, okay? You have the sale of church positions for what? Money. That's called simony. All right? So kings... We're seeking to to grow their own power and authority uh, against the church in some cases by selling church positions or appointing those who would serve as bishops or fulfill these offices within the church. Okay. Now, if you're a Catholic pope, is that acceptable? No, because in your mind, who should be the only one that determines who fills these positions? You do. You and the church. Okay. So, over time, a series of things happens. And then you're going to have, if, if you read the church history books, um, that what they're going to do is they're going to talk about a series of reforming popes. Okay? Well, don't get confused by that. Because when they say reforming, what they're trying to do is not, like, change the church for the better. They're trying to make sure that the church continues to consolidate and hold on to power. Okay? So... Through a series of reforming popes attempted to tackle the problem, Matthew A. Price and Michael Collins, authors of the story of Christianity, 2,000 Years of Faith, um, offer the following explanation. Primarily, they wish to end the buying and selling of church offices and to see bishops and abbots elected by their clergy or monks, not appointed by lay lords. 
Okay? At the same time, they wanted the clergy to be outside the jurisdiction of a secular court so that the lay, lay lords, who often controlled the courts, could not use them to coerce clergy. So they don't want, the reason they don't want uh, that process to continue is because the lords and kings, through lay investiture and selling of offices for money, are now controlling what these bishops are doing, and is that okay with the church? But that's not okay, okay? So they also tried to enforce clerical celibacy, which was still widely being flaunted, with married clergy sometimes treating their offices as hereditary positions. So you have a few things here, okay? You have, number one, the issue of simony, the selling of church positions. You have, number two, the issue of lay investiture. Who has the authority to appoint bishops, okay? And number three, you have the issue that much of the clergy was not following the Catholic mandate to remain celibate. And so they were fathering children, in some cases openly getting married. If not, they were fathering children, and then they thought that it was... Up, that they could then pass on their seat of authority to, to their children like anybody else would pass on any other kind of inheritance or whatever. And so from the eyes of the popes looking at this, all that stuff has to be reformed. Okay? Well, how do you reform it? How do you reform it if you're a pope? You take away, you take the power of the king... The, you remove from the kings the power to appoint bishops, right? You enforce your church teaching and doctrine as far as the celibacy of the clergy, and you ban and outlaw simony. That's essentially how you do it, okay? Now, all of these campaigns reached a peak when Cardinal Hillebrand took the papal throne as Gregory VII in 1073. He brought papal claims to a new level, declaring that no one on earth had jurisdiction over the papacy, while popes could depose even emperors. Okay? So, no one on earth could tell a pope what to do, but a pope could tell an emperor what to do according to the pope. Now, that's convenient, okay? Now, <coughs> Jonathan Hill author of Zondervan Handbook on to the History of Christianity, elaborates further on Gregory's papal decree in 1075. It stated that no one can judge the Pope, that the Pope alone can appoint and depose bishops, that he can depose kings and emperors, and that his rule extends over earthly rulers, must kiss his feet when they approach him, and that all Popes are automatically saints. <laughs> So he, is, he, he takes the papal throne in 1073, and in 1075 he issues that papal um, statement, okay? Now I have in here, I didn't, if you have a copy of the papal power book, if you pick this up, alright, on page 35, uh, Hudson goes through great detail all of the things that this papal decree of 1075 states. Okay, so if you want to read the entire thing, you can. Uh, he quotes it here, and you can you can read through the whole thing on page uh, thirty five of, of the book that uh, Brother Lee has offered. But just a few things, real quick. He says that this is a, the this is the condensed summary of the elongated uh, papal statement. The Roman Church was founded by God alone. The Roman bishop is properly called universal. He alone may depose bishops and reinstate them. Uh, he alone may use the insignia of the empire. The Pope is the only person whose feet are kissed by all princes. His council may be regarded as, gener as a general one without his consent. So if you have a church council and you don't get the consent of the Pope, then it's not a general council, it's not a universal council, because the universal head of the church didn't approve the council. Yeah, you, you just go on and on here. No one shall dare to condemn one who appeals to the papal see. That means his seat. Uh, the Roman Church has never erred or ever by the witness of Scripture shall err to all eternity. Okay. Now that's the attitude of the leaders of the church that are killing all these other people that we've been talking about the last three weeks. Okay. So, Gregory's pronouncements 
were also a declaration of war against the practice of investiture, whereby secular rulers appointed bishops and abbots. All right? In the same year that he issued them, the Pope deposed and excommunicated no less a person than the Holy Roman Emperor Henry IV. Okay? For trying to overrule the papal choice for the Bishop of Milan. So understand what's going on here. He issues this decree and says, He alone has the power to do what? Appoint bishops. He can depose emperors. He can do all these things. And the church never errs and all this sort of stuff that we just went over. Okay? And so when he issues this decree, Henry IV does not agree that whoever he put in there as Bishop of Milan should be Bishop of Milan. So the Pope excommunicates him. All right? And deposes him as the emperor. Now, Gregory is going to be summoned to Rome to explain his conduct here. And Henry's answer was to convene in 1076 a, a, a synod of German bishops that declared Gregory a usurper and unfit to occupy the Roman see. So understand, the, the, the emperor calls together his own church meeting and gets these guys to declare the pope to be what? A counterfeit or not the rightful heir of the papal seat. So is this guy gonna go head to, gonna go toe to toe here with the Pope over this issue? Okay? Now, wherefore, this is his, wherefore henceforth we renounce now and for the future all obedience to thee. This is his statement to the Pope. In retaliation, Gregory excommunicated Henry and deposed him, absolving his subjects from the oaths of allegiance. So do we? Do you have a real sort of a church battle going on with this? Okay. Now look at the. Here's the picture. Well, we'll get to there in a second. At last, driven to make peace with the Holy Father by a revolt among the German nobles, Henry appeared before Gregory in January 1077 at uh, Canossa, a castle in the in the mountains of Italy, dressed as a penitent. The emperor stood barefoot in the snow for three days and begged forgiveness until, in Gregory's words, we loosed the chain of anathema and at length received him into the lap of Holy Mother Church. And Gregory goes in and kisses the Pope's feet. Henry. Henry, sorry. He goes in and kisses Pope Gregory's feet and all is now forgiven. The anathema, the, the bowl of excommunication is removed and now he is accepted back into the church because... He has done what who wanted him to do? The Pope. Okay? Any questions about any of this? It just shows you how much they really believe that salvation was through the church. And mm -hmm. that big of a foot kisser after all that. You know? So this is, this is a king actually doing what the papal statement said he should do. And the Pope had the authority and the power to capitulate him to do it. Okay? Now, the problem of lay investiture was not really settled until 1122 by the compromise known as the Concordant of Worms. The church maintained the right to elect, uh, I should say holder, of an ecclesiastical office, but only in the presence of the emperor or his representative. So they do eventually come to somewhat of an agreement here, but who still maintained the power to appoint the bishop? The Pope did. Okay, yeah? What is lay investiture? Lay means non-clergy. 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 Non
definite root in Western Christendom. Bernard of Clairvaux, I think is how you say it, expressed the theory as follows. The two swords belong to St. Peter. One, the spiritual sword is in his hands. The other, the temporal sword, is at his command whenever it is necessary to what? So what is he saying? It's necessary to use the sword. And so who can yield the power of the sword as well as the power of the, the spiritual realm? The Pope. So what you're, what you're seeing here now is a formal statement being adopted by the church and the papacy about their power that with a, with a whole sort of philosophical explanation to go along with it, and it's called the theory of the two swords. Now... The theory of the two swords, the one temporal, the other spiritual, was based upon the Gospel of Luke. Why don't you go to Luke chapter 22. Now, you know, the other thing they're, the other thing they're doing here is they're, they're really playing on words. Because you remember what happened the night Jesus was arrested. Right? What did Peter do? Cut up that guy's ear, and Christ told him to do what? Put down his sword. Put down his sword. So they're they're playing real fast and loose here because they're saying, see, the the, the, the heirs of St. Peter have always had two what? Swords. Two swords. They have the apostolic authority that Christ put in Peter as the rock of the foundation of the church, which we've already studied. But as in that position, he also had the power of a second sword, literally being a military weapon. Luke chapter 22 Verse 38. And they said, The Lord be and the let me start over. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, It is enough. So based on that verse, they come up with this whole philosophical argument, theological philosophical argument about the popes having the authority of two what? Swords. swords. So the combination of that verse and the story about what Peter did. They are then using it as a justification for this whole teaching and doctrine about the true power and authority of the Pope not just being spiritual, but also being what? Temporal or political. Okay? In the letter, this is some Latin stuff here. Um, Innocent clearly, Innocent clearly differentiates between spiritual and secular powers leaving no doubt that the spiritual is supreme. He, listen to this. He used the analogy of the sun and the moon. The former represented the pontifical authority and the latter the royal. So the sun represents the authority of the Pope and the moon represents a temporal authority if you're following the illustration. okay. In the Detratel, whatever that Latin phrase is, the argument for the temporal power being subservient to that of the spiritual rests on the claim that the very right and power of the emperor comes from the apostolic seed. In other words, the reason why any king has any authority is because the pope allows them to wield it. Okay? If the pope does not agree, if the pope does not like that person, they are well within their right and within their means to just tell them what? No, you're done. And depose them and so forth. Innocent's assertion, now here, see, here's where the history comes in, is historically rooted in the coronation of Charlemagne by the Pope. In one of his sermons on the meaning of pontif on pontifical consecration, Innocent declared, I have obtained from Peter the mitre for my priesthood and the crown for my royalty. He has made me vicar of him upon whose vesture is written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now look, I just want to digress for a second. Innocent is one of the popes that issues forth commands and orders to kill the Wadensians and other groups. Now, look, 
if that guy there thinks you're a heretic, there's probably a pretty good chance that you're not. Okay? If that guy there can stand up and preach that he's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and the representative of Christ on earth and all the junk that he's saying here, and he calls you a heretic and, 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 and unleashes the Inquisition and does all the stuff to go, you know, well, all the things we've been studying the last, you know, two, three weeks, it's pretty, it's pretty clear to me that I'm going to say that my, my, my first inclination just based on that alone is that the group or whoever he's calling a heretic, prob if, you're, if you're looking at who's calling him a heretic, probably isn't even half as heretical as that guy. Okay? Now, when you start to look at further into the history and what happened and what they believe, like we've done in the last few weeks, you see, you see that the inclination is most often confirmed that that was the case. Okay? Now, during the pontificate of, In of Innocent III, nearly, listen to this, nearly every European ruler submitted to the power and authority of the Roman Church. If judged necessary, the papacy could find some legitimate spiritual justification for intervention in almost every public event. If, there was, if they, they could find some reason why they should intervene if they thought they needed to. Okay? Uh, the one whose title was Vicar of Christ and successor of the Prince of the Apostles, who was representative of him to whom belonged the earth and all that it contains, and all those who inhabit it, could hardly, could hardly conceive of papal power being anything less than a superpower, which all, with ultimate authority over both the temporal and the spiritual affairs of mankind. Okay, so is this a religious state? Is Europe a religious state in the Middle Ages that is basically being lorded over by an absolute ruler? Yes. And the absolute ruler also happens to be the head of a church who is using his religious powers of persuasion to consolidate and increase his own power and the power of that church to basically get anybody else in Europe at the time to do what they wanted them to. Okay? Now, before we move on to the next point, does anybody have any questions or comments? Mm -hmm. Did they, um, did the Pope, like, expect these emperors and stuff to pay them, pay them for anything? I mean, oh, yeah. money to, for them to they paid. They paid a church tax. Yeah, church tax. The, church, okay. the church had a lot of taxes. Especially, not, not quite yet where we're at here, but as we move forward, eventually they're going to start building the mad, the monster cathedrals. Well, that's what and stuff like that. that. Who, all how's all that from? being paid for? Yeah. That's being paid for by the peasants and the taxes that the church is putting on the, on the, the people. And things that are going to come in later, like indulgences, that are going to be sold in exchange for salvation and lessing, the lessening of stays in purgatory and all sorts of other wonderful things. That's where Luther came in. Luke? He, he questioned that. He questioned that. that. He questioned that, yes. That's that practice had been being done for hundreds of years before Luther. Yeah. When they <clears throat> set up the Constitution for the United States, was that part of what was in the idea of the men then? That the, the church would never become so big to power over the government and vice versa? The, I'll, I'll <coughs> talk about that more specifically when we get to that era okay. in the history. But in a sense, they, what they did, all of, those, all of those colonists that came over came from Europe, right? Yeah. Where all of these old religious rivalries were extremely bitter and had caused war after war after war after war. So, and then when, if you look at how the colonies were settled, they were settled in denominationally restricted patterns. Okay? So, for example, in the south in Georgia, you had the Baptists. In the middle colonies like Pennsylvania, you had Quakers. Um, you had... It, it, then you had a colony like Maryland, which was strictly Catholic. 
Then you had the Massachusetts area where you had the Puritans and, uh, and, and so forth. So when, when all of these groups began to identify themselves as, a com as American, as a common group, that one of the big questions that came up was, well, what are we going to do about the religion? Do we want to have a state religion or not? And so that's where the whole idea came from that, well, no, we're, we don't really want that because we, that's one of the reasons why we came over here to begin with is to get away from all that stuff. So that's a quick answer to your question, I think. Any other questions or comments? Sounds like a one-world government way back then. <laughs> yes. Look, when the book of Revelation 17 yeah. says that she ruled, that, remember we, we go to Revelation 17. When it, when it says some of these things, there are... Revelation 17, 1. We've been over this already, but... And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show unto you the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have made been drunk with the wine of her fornication. So, she, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of the names of blasphemy and having uh, seven heads and ten horns and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls having a golden cup in her hand full of the, abom full of the abominations and filthiness of her fornication and upon her forehead was a name written mystery battle on the great the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth and I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus and, and when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I tell unto you the mystery of the woman and the beast which carries her, uh, which hath the seven, uh, the seven heads and ten horns. The beast which thou sawest was and is not. And then she, he goes on down through here. But there, go to verse um, 9. And, 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 here, and here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are, are seven mountains on which the women sitteth. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and he goes on through here. But the bottom line is, there's a reason why many interpreters view this woman as Rome. Which we went over already. But she sits and rules over, look it, you know, everybody... <laughs> This, this church state that we're talking about here that has this kind of a power and this kind of authority is every bit authoritative, authoritarian, dictatorial as Stalin's Soviet Union, as Hitler's Germany, as any of it. And they killed more people than any of those regimes combined. Okay? Now you you know you can say I'm being unkind and be mad at me and whatever if you want to be, but it's 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 a, it's a fact. Yeah. I understand that uh, the Confraternity New Testament, which is put out by the Roman Church, has a footnote stating that that chapter regarding the woman is the Roman Church. They have that in their own. In their own. Glad that I, I showed you the coin, right? Six weeks ago, that was minted by the Pope that has the woman sitting on the chair, holding the cup, sitting on the earth with a cup in her hand, with the inscription around it, Latin, that says, the world is her seat. Well, what's the passage say? It says that exact thing. So, you know, anyway, I don't want to get too bogged down in that, but you understand, right, okay, that what's going on with this church. Now, the great schism... If you look at the standard church history book, okay, they're gonna they, they are gonna portray the history that there's been one universal church, and that in 1054 there was a division between the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church, okay, and that anybody else in that intermittent time period that dissented was heretical and was never and should not be considered a part of the true Roman church.
Okay? So 1054 is a date that is significant in church history simply because this is when the division occurs between the Catholics and the Orthodox. Now, how many of you even know there was such a thing? In modern Christendom, you essentially have three major divisions. You have Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant. Now, from there, you obviously can break it down way further, right? You have Russian Orthodox, which is slightly different from Eastern Orthodox. Protestant, I mean, take your pick, right? Baptist, Lutheran, uh, Methodist, whoops. I mean, you, you, you can keep going, right? But you understand my point, right? So, modern church history books are going to say that until 1054, there's only been what? One true church. And then in 1054, there's a split or a schism where this church in the east breaks off from that church in the west. And then in 1517, you get Luther and the 95 Theses and stuff like that. And then you have the beginning of what's called the Protestant or Protestant movement. A group that protested who? Catholics. Catholics. Okay? So, 1054 is a date because it's viewed as what's called the Great Schism. Alright? Now, by the beginning of the 11th century, the cultural and religious differences between the East and and the West were set to cause problems. The East had allowed, had allowed Hellenistic, that's Greek, tradition to continue, uh, little altered for a thousand years. In the West, few were able to understand Greek. The East began to look upon the West as uneducated and uncultured barbarians. Okay? In addition, the Eastern and Western churches were divided over the exact wording of the Nicene Creed. You remember the Nicene Creed? Okay? So they, they don't agree. A Latin church added one Latin word to the creed, thereby altering its meaning. Okay? So it originally said, The Spirit proceeds from the Father. The Latin, the Western church, alters it and says, The Spirit proceeds from the Father and who? The Son. So one one branch of the of the church is using one version of the creed, and another branch is using a different version of the creed. They say, "Well, what's the big deal?" Well, Jones does a pretty good job explaining this to you. Okay, he says that in the first place, both Eastern and Roman Christians believing that they had been led by the Scriptures and the Holy Spirit had approved the Nicene Creed at the councils of Ephesus and Chalaron. Chaldon, they had continue, uh, committed themselves never to change the creed. So there's a problem of order here in the minds of the Eastern Church, where when the creed was originally written, they agreed that the creed would never be what? Change. change. But here you are now moving you know, a few hundred years through the history, and now one group is using one version, the other group is using a different version. <laughs> now, you see why you don't want to get too messed up in the creeds? Because if you, if you take the creeds as your authority and not the Word of God, then you're going to have to start arguing about, well, who's changing the creed? Okay? This doesn't seem like a great big issue. I mean, I can't figure it out. I, mean, I, I wouldn't say one is right and one is wrong. This is one issue amongst many. Okay? Both groups agree. Now, you pay attention to that pretty close, okay? Both groups agree that God is one being in three persons. Yet each group envisioned the Trinity differently. Roman theologians believe that the, div the divine dwelt equally in the Father, Son, and Spirit. According to Eastern thinkers, one being can dwell in only one person. In their view, divinity dwells only in the Father. The Father shares the divine being with the Son and the Spirit. This does not, however, decrease the, divinity, the deity of the Son or the Spirit. So what you're really into now is a bunch of philosophical, theological wrangling of words. Okay? As a result, Eastern Christians could state the Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son. 
but they cannot confess that the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. If the Spirit arose from the Father and the Son, the Son would be sharing divine being, which could come only from God the Father with the Holy Spirit, according to the Eastern churches. Now, if you read that and you're like, what? Yeah. Yeah. Okay? Don't feel like you're alone. Okay? So that's one issue. you got differences in culture. Now look at it. Is there differences in the scriptural text too? The Western Roman text of the Vulgate is not the same as the Eastern text of the Byzantine text type. Okay? So you've got differences in the, in the, in the way that the groups are functioning culturally. Then you have this creedal issue of the dispute over how the creed should read and, and all the theological junk that came from that. But then in 867, uh, Potius, or Photius, I don't know how you say it, the Bishop of Constantinople in the Eastern Empire denounced and added the phrase. Yeah. Five years later, denounced the added phrase, sorry. Five years later, the Pope offered to drop and the son from the Nicene Creed. But there was a condition. Eastern churches had to accept the Pope's absolute supremacy over all churches throughout the world. Okay, we'll drop the phrase that you object to, but you have to accept the fact that I am the head over all the churches. So what do we really care more about? Theological precision and making sure the doctrine is right, or consolidating and growing the power base and structure of the church? The Eastern Church is going to say what to that? Take a hike. We don't. We're not interested in that. All right. In 1084, Pope Leo IX sparked a clash with Byzantium by asserting his spiritual authority, holding a synod to reform the Sicilian Church and appointing a new Archbishop of Sicily. Okay. Now. He, the, he was met with furious opposition by the Patriarch of Constantinople, uh, Michael uh, Suriaris, uh, Curiaris, who was perhaps encouraged by the Emperor of the East. What he does is, in retaliation for the Pope's refusal to cooperate, ordered the closure of Western churches in Constantinople and expelled the clergy. So now you got a church fight on your hand, right? So in the eastern portion, they order all the all the Western Roman churches that are there close and refuse them or forbade them from worshiping in the Roman manner in the east. Okay? So the Pope is the head of the church, he's got to do something, right? So Leo sent envo envoys to Constantinople and attempt to restore peace, led by the Pope's friend Cardinal Hubert de Sevilla uh, Candina. Before leaving Rome, uh, Humbert drafted a papal bull of excommunication, and on July 16, 1054, he marched into the Church of the of Holy Wisdom of Constantinople during the Eucharist and slammed the bull of excommunication on the altar and walked out of the church. Oh yeah, you got to close our churches? Take that. Walks up. Jones reports that the papal bull cited the following errors in the Eastern Church as justification for their excommunication. Allow priests to marry. That is true. They weren't allowing priests to marry. Okay? But the Roman Church had done the same thing for several centuries, which we talked about earlier in this lesson. Number two, refuse to recognize baptisms performed in Roman churches. Scandalous. Three, had deleted and the son from the Nicene Creed. Which is completely opposite from the truth. They had added it. Okay, so these are the reasons why they're justified in excommunicating the whole Eastern Church. An Eastern bishop, an Eastern deacon grabbed the bull and begged, begged him to take it back, but he refused. An altered creed and brash bull created a gash between the Eastern and Western churches. The Crusades would deliver a third strike, thereby making the break complete. Now at that point, things probably could have been resolved. 
if each side was good, was willing to give, but something's going to happen, we're going to see in a minute, which is going to make no resolution possible between the two sides. So that's how you get Eastern Orthodox and Catholic division. Okay? Now from there, what church is going to spread out into Russia? Orthodox. This Orthodox brand of Christianity. So how are you going to get the Russian Orthodox Church? Okay, um, that Eastern Orthodox mentality is going to, you know, is good. That's why it's located more in those areas of the world around Old Constantinople. All the all the Stan countries, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, a lot of those old Soviet bloc countries are either Russian Orthodox or Eastern Orthodox. If they're not Muslim, they're not Roman Catholic in the Western sense because of that split in 1054. Okay. Now, so here's what we end up with. All these areas over here in red, these are the Catholic-controlled areas. These regions in blue, up here in the Russia, the Slavic principalities, and so forth, and eventually this area in here is all going to become predominantly Orthodox. All right. Questions about that? Which side of our Bible? The manuscripts that are being that our Bible are taken from are definitely more from this area here. From the Byzantium, from the Balkans, from this this area here. It's where the majority of those manuscripts are going to be are going to originate from. See now, here's but here's what they do. Okay, the majority of the manuscripts back up the reading of what the King James. So they, 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 they play a trick. So what they then do is they divide the manuscripts, that's what MSS means, into families. Okay? And if you read, if you read what they have to say, they'll talk about the Western family. They'll talk about the, um, uh, what's the other one called? The Alexandrian family, and so forth. And then they'll talk about the, the Byzantine, uh, or the Eastern family, and so instead of giving the, the priority witness to the majority of the manuscripts, what they do is they give the primary witness to the majority of the families. You see how sneaky they are? These two families here have something like 75 manuscripts in them. This family here has... Probably some 5,000 plus manuscripts in it. You see what they do? Majority. They escape the majority here by dividing them into families and, and saying, well, if more families outweigh one family, then that's where the true text is. You see what they do? It's, it's the same fundamental argument that started the French Revolution. Before the French Revolution, you had three estates in France. You had the first estate, which was Roman Catholic clergy. The second estate, which was the nobility. 2% of the population was in the first and second estate. 98% of the French population was in the third estate. And when the king, when Louis XVI tried to make the French nobles pay taxes, and they said no, when they were paying none, zero, goose egg, no taxes, okay, and they said, no, we're not going to pay taxes. And they forced the king to call a meeting of what's called the Estates General, where all three estates would be represented at the meeting. The first argument in the meeting that they couldn't get passed was, how do you count the votes? Because if you give, if you give each estate one vote, who's always going to win? The first and the second estate are always going to vote together against the third estate. But if you give each delegate in the meeting one vote, then who's always going to win? The third estate, because there's 98% of the population representing the third estate. Well, it's the same thing here. If you just go by the majority witness of the manuscripts, this, this, this is going to win hands down every time. So to get away from that and to move the discussion away from that, they've replaced it with this whole argument about family trees and all this other stuff, so that... Well, if more than one family outweighs this one, well, then that one must be right. 
Now, I'm summarizing big time, okay? But that's fundamentally what's going on. Okay. The Crusades. I don't know how we're going to get done with this. But if we don't, we'll finish it next Sunday. And I'm not going to try to cruise through it too fast. You know, I don't think there's any topic that is more controversial possibly than the Crusades. Because the average non-believer will always say, well, I can't believe in a religion that would do something like the Crusades. You ever heard that before? That's just a smart aleck answer. The people that are running the Crusades are not Bible-believing Christians. They are papists doing what the Pope tells them to do. That's look. If you want to think I'm unkind or whatever, you can go ahead and think that. But that's that's what happened. Okay. Many medieval people believed that they could prove their desire to turn from sin by going on a pilgrimage. Imagine having that idea of justification, having to prove yourself to God by going on a pilgrimage. The supreme pilgrimage led to Jerusalem. To impede a pilgrim's journey was, from the medieval church's perspective, to imperil a person's salvation. Since 638 A.D., Muslims had controlled Jerusalem and all the roads that led to the city. On the road to Jerusalem, Muslim converts, Turks, began to force Christian pilgrims to, to pay vast tariffs or taxes to get into the city. Okay? Now... In 1093, Byzantine Emperor Alexis Comensis sent an appeal to Robert, Count of Flanders, asking for his help against the Muslim Turks who were threatening to conquer Constantinople. Alright? The appeal read, Come then with all your people and give battle with all your strength, so that all this treasure shall not fall into the hands of the Turks. Therefore act while there is still time, lest the kingdom of the Christians shall vanish from your sight, what is more important than the holy what what is more important, the holy sepulcher shall vanish, and in coming you will find your reward in heaven, and if you do not come, God will condemn you. So he appeals, so this is the this is the emperor of the Eastern Empire now, after the ten fifty four schism appealing to this guy to send an army to help him defend Constantinople against the Turks. Okay, So what happens is, the Pope is going to read this. Pope Urban II is going to read the letter. And he's going to issue a call for what is called a crusade or holy war to gain control of the Holy Land. And over the next 300 years, numerous such crusades are going to be launched. All right. Now, Lorette, who we've picked on, quite a bit for his treatment of the so-called heretics, he is going to do a fair job summarizing the reasons here for this. Okay, uh, So he's going to talk about the religious goals of the Crusades. He says, first of all, in the minds of many was the rescue from the Muslims, and that's how they used to spell it, of the places in Palestine, especially Jerusalem, which were sacred to the Christian. <coughs> to bring them into Christian hands and keep them was ostensibly the chief objective of the Crusades. Another phase of the religious motive was the protection of the Byzantine Empire against the Muslim Turks. As we have said, the Turks were threatening the historic bulwark of Christendom. The Byzantine emperors appealed to the Christians of the West for assistance, and the popes were disposed to give it. Now, why do you think the popes would do that? Because they're just such kind, wonderful, loving people? Or because they viewed it as politically advantageous for them to help them and get them back under their dominion. Okay? Initially, or immediately, related to the second religious motive was a third, the desire of the popes to heal the breach between the western and eastern wings of the Catholic Church and restore Christian unity. Alright? Mark A. Knoll, author of Turning Points, Decisive Moments in the History of Christianity, points out that Pope Urban was also please, or also possess political motives for the Crusades. Noel states, in addition, Urban believed that an armed expedition from Europe to the Holy Land would also relieve escalating pressures in his homeland. 
The tendency of violence that was built into the feudal system of competing lords and aggressive knights had become a mounting concern for the church. Its efforts to curtail the widespread violence had led to uh, what were called the truce of God and the peace of God, church enforced periods where fighting was supposed to stop. These efforts Urban now added to the ideal of a crusade. So he's got his own problems at home. All of the within that structure of feudalism, there's an inherent militarism in there. Where the lords and the knights are going to constantly be battling each other and jockeying for position and all that sort of thing. And the famous medieval tournament was actually created as a way for these guys to practice their martial skills without necessarily killing each other. And so the church institutes days where all fighting and stuff like that is supposed to be banned. So in addition to these religious motives, the popes see this as a violent outlet for this pent-up aggression of, the, of the, the, the feudal knights and so forth, to send them over there and go, you know, whoop up on the Muslims and win back Jerusalem. So, by 1097, listen to this, with the assurance of a place in heaven by the Pope, he promises immediate absolution of all sin for anyone who fights in the crusades and immediate entrance into heaven with, a, with no purgatory. Wow! I'd be there too. Three armies wearing white tunics with red crosses had assembled outside Constantinople. This ill-prepared army of French, Bohemians, Germans, Englishmen, Scots, Italians, and Spaniards knew nothing of the geography, climate, or culture of the so-called Holy Land and possessed no grand strategy for capturing Jerusalem. And by the way, the majority of them were Franks. They were Frankish. Which you would expect, because who have been the protectors of the papacy thus far? The Franks. Yet somehow, an army of 12,000, less than one-fourth of the original army, of European knights and foot soldiers, captured the city of Jerusalem on July 15, 1099 and secure a narrow strip of land stretching 65 miles from Edessa in the north to Jerusalem in the south. Okay? Now, i, I got to tell you... What? 65 or 600? 650, I'm sorry. That is the high water mark of the entire Crusades. Okay? So here's, here's what we're talking about, okay? The Crusaders are going to come all the way down here. They're going to gather around Constantinople. And then from there, this army of 12,000 is going to march south. And this strip here, I think I got it on the next slide. This strip is essentially the kingdom called the, 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 four, uh, it, it's the four kingdoms of the, uh, the, the victorious Crusaders that are going to be carved out there in the Middle East along that roughly 650-mile strip of land. That's the high water mark of the Crusades. In the fir is is the first. Okay, the Crusaders acted with remarkable brutality, massacring the inhabitants of the cities they captured and even eating some of them. An act which, for many years, led Muslims to regard all Europeans as cannibals. Okay. The most significant outcome of the Crusades was the cementing of the break. Let, let me say this. We could spend two lessons just talking about all the minutiae of the Crusades. Here's what you need to know. You need to know why they were called. You need to know that the first one is the only one that really did anything as far as accomplishing anything. And that the major outcome in church history regarding the Crusades is that they cemented the split between the Roman and Orthodox Church. Okay? Now, judging by the time, I think I'm going to stop... And we'll finish this next Sunday. Because I was already planning two parts on the eternal history of the church in the Middle Ages. So somebody make a note where we stop so that you can remind me. Uh, Joan of Arc is, had nothing to do with the Crusades. She was in the Hundred Years' War between France and England. So... Any questions about any of that so far? Yeah. I read a book. I couldn't say it because I didn't read it, but it was on the internet. That they were looking at the Crusades, and the Muslims were attacking the so called Christian Stuart. It was a completely different 
you know how the Christians always the going the bowling and the slaughtering and stuff. Right. And the Muslims had come back and come too. So um, I wish I could give you a book book. Well, I mean, the, 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 re, the reason, the motivator is the call of the Eastern Emperor, Empire to summon Christian knights to help defend Constantinople against the Muslims. So the Muslims were attacking and trying to increase their own caliphates and kingdoms and so forth. It's definitely true. Well, that division between the uh, Roman Catholic and the Orthodox... That, for the most part, is, I mean, there's a little bit of animosity there still, but for the most part, the Pope has uh, supremacy over all of them, is he not? Or no, not so much? In the minds of the Orthodox, they are still a separate church. So do they have their own Pope then? Or? They don't have a Pope. They're... One of the things I can do between now and next week is include a few summary statements about how, they're, more specifics about how they're different. Okay? Mm -hmm. Which I had been inclined to do before but sort of forgot mm -hmm. because this, this is the, the big the big reason why the crusades are important from a church history standpoint isn't because they converted all the Muslims to Christendom okay it isn't because they they only held these kingdoms for a hundred years and they lost all of them and never got them back in all the successive crusades okay that were fought by the will of God and because God willed it and all that other nonsense. Never. They've actually, in the, in the Second Crusade, got whooped quite, quite soundly, and in the Third Crusade and the Fourth, they never even made it to where they were supposed to go and attacked Constantinople instead. Because we got to attack somebody. We're an army. <laughs> yeah. I think what uh, Will may be referring to, though, is that uh, the last Pope, uh, John Paul, I believe, um, I remember this being in the news that he and the guy that was in charge of the Eastern Church embraced each other and unexcommunicated each other. And that, that was in the news, and some people made a big deal about it. If that's it. true, I don't dispute that. I, I don't. That's probably true. I don't remember that myself. But even if it. That's nice that they can get together and sing Kumbaya, but for the average person in those churches, that really doesn't mean anything. Because the traditions that they have instilled within those two different branches of Christendom are just so different now because of what happened, you know, 1,500 years ago. Just another thing in the paper this week, I the Pope has forgiven the Jewish people for killing the Lord. Yeah. Well, I, I read that. <laughs> this yeah. this Pope uh, Benedict, I think is his name. He, I, I have it printed out at home. I read that that thing. It's a it's a book that's coming out in the middle of this month that Benedict wrote, and he actually, from the quote I read, he's he's pretty much states that the church has wrongly interpreted the scriptures all along. And that um, the blood of Christ does not cry out for vengeance, but is for forgiveness. I have, I have. That's the one thing that they quoted. The book has not yet been released, but some people have read pre-release copies. Well, somebody it. read it. And tell me what it's about. Yeah. It's nice for the Pope to say that, but unless he's going to say that. There's no salvation in the sacraments, and that they're not a means of grace, and you know all the other things that they that are official canonized teaching of the church. What does it really mean? Well, what I think is significant about it is that he is saying that the church made mistakes, um, and that kind of changes their doctrine. I disagree. You don't think that no, that he's uh, he's, he says that all the time about the same thing, and then they go right off the end of all. Yeah. <laughs> but that, that, it seems to me that that would eventually affect their canon law to some extent. It would if if they called the council and changed it. So if he's really serious. Um, well, this article I read said that this this statement had been made at a council a few years ago, but that most before Roman he was Catholics, um, no, I don't think it was before he was pope. Okay. At a council a few years ago, and that most Roman Catholics, however, do not read what the councils write, 
and that the Pope actually writing a book, they'll read that and it will trickle down into their understanding of things better. That's what the I think that's I don't I don't dispute that. That's probably true. I, I, I can pretty much guarantee you that the average Catholic's not sitting down with canon law and saying, hmm, what did yeah. the Fifth Lateran Council say? Yeah, but they'll read the Pope's book. Probably. Right, because it's the Pope. Um, I can bring the article in next week. I yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah. Istanbul. 